Hello, it's Mike from Brew-Jews.com, and guess what? It's just me this week. So I figured uh, I would show you two different mash ton setups that I used. Uh, why do I have two mash tons, and how do I use both mash tons? I know we've gotten a lot of comments in the past about uh, some more equipment talk, some more highlights of equipment that we use. Uh, so tonight I'm just going to show you the equipment, and then hopefully in the future we'll do a video with the uh, brewing techniques and see the see the equipment in action. So uh, why don't you grab yourself a beer? I have one right here, and uh, let's talk about mash tons. Cheers. All right, I don't really think you need to see me for this, but I'm going to show you. Let's start with the outside of my Sankey converted keg mash ton, right? So this is a 15 gallon keg. It's a standard half barrel keg uh, that I've cut the top out of and modified for a mash ton. So I'm going to show you the outside features first right now. Um, so I've got a ball valve on the bottom, standard ball valve, nothing too special here. Uh, this is a non-welded uh, coupling here, so it's just a hole and two washers sandwiched together and put in there. Um, this is a thermometer, same deal, it's a weldless conversion uh, into a hole I drilled, put this in here. Um, I don't really refer to this too much because um, it's sometimes in the mash, sometimes not in the mash, depending on how uh, big of a mash I'm doing. This rib right here is, this first rib is about five, uh, five and a quarter gallons. Um, and so a mash, depending on how big the massage mass it mash is, it's it's it, the thermometer could or could not be in the mash. So I don't rely on this for temperature. Um, and you'll see the probe on the inside of the keg when we look inside. Uh, and then up here I have this port here. So I use a I use this mash ton on a direct burner, direct fired system, with a false bottom in the bottom bottom, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but I put this port on the top because I use a pump to recirculate the mash the entire process. So wort is coming out of the bottom from underneath the mash ton and then it's coming back up and returning here and I usually have a return tube in the top. So why don't we take a look inside and maybe some of that will make a little bit more sense. Alright, I think this is a pretty good view downside, down into the mash ton. Um, there's going to be some echoing because my voice is going to uh, reverberate in and out of the mash and as I look inside there it's going to sound weird but um, so let's just start at the top um, outside the keg uh, remember I talked about there's a return line and so this one I sort of did practice trying to uh, not necessarily weld it in there but I soldered it in there um, and I've got a brass nipple on there so for the return tube setup when this is full of a mash which is usually comes up about halfway um, or a little bit less uh, right to about you can see the pointed probe here sticking out. This is the where the thermometer is. That's what the thermometer looks like sticking out. Um, so I just usually put a, a piece of tubing like this, maybe a little bit shorter, depends on how deep the mash is. And this is my return. And I will, I can put it up against the side like this and have it kind of um, come around. I know there are fancier ways to do this, but sometimes I might just peg it like that with a clamp on the side of the keg. Um, you can see here this is the, I've cut this opening pretty wide open. This originally was one of my first uh, brew kettles when I first tried to do this with a converted keg. So um, I cut this pretty wide but um, the reason for this is because sometimes I'll put a lid on here um, to try to keep the heat in there but when I'm doing direct fire I usually don't necessarily need to have a lid. Um, although you, you might see a lid in some of the videos where I've used it. Just try to retain some heat. Um, so this is the return tube and I just usually have it go on there. Um, sometimes I might actually take an old lid from a brew bucket and put that on top of the mash and have this sprinkle on top of that just to help diffuse the water across the top of the mash tun. But let me get this out of the way so you can um, see the rest of the workings here. Pull that out. So all the way down the bottom you can see my false bottom. I'll try to take a picture of that and get a better close up. Um, but then that false bottom doesn't sit exactly in the middle, but it's pretty close to the middle. Uh, I just got a copper tube that I soldered myself to make a dip tube that goes into the center of the thing. And um, it's just on there with a normal compression fitting. Uh, I, it's on there pretty loose right now, so I'll take it out so you can see it. What it sort of looked like. So, um, this is what it looks like. It's a 
um, 90 degrees. This is just another piece of that high temp silicone tubing because this pipe is, let me see if I can get it in focus there, this pipe is half inch and the hole in the center of my falls bottom, you can see it there, is just slightly bigger than that. So I found out if I just put this piece of tubing on here, um, it actually fills in that hole pretty nice. It's not secured in there, it's, it's loose. I mean, nothing gets by it. Uh, once the grain bed's set, it works pretty good. So uh, this compression side um, just screws on to a brass fitting at the bottom of the um, inside of the bulkhead from the uh, ball valve on the outside. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, I don't think there's anything different about this setup that you'd find too many other people. Um, I've cobbled the pieces together. Um, and it works pretty good for me. So why don't we switch over and I'll show you how I mash in the plastic cooler mash tun. All right, this is the outside of the plastic cooler. This is just a standard, what they call a beverage cooler. Um, this is a 10 gallon Igloo cooler, I'm not endorsing Igloo or any way, but um, uh, you can just try to find these as cheap as you can get them. Um, so this, just like on the uh, stainless steel cooler, I just have a weldless bulkhead that goes through here. There's, you can see a big washer in the back there. And then when we look inside, there's a washer on the inside. It's just sandwiched together with a, a nipple and it screws together so it keeps it from leaking. Um, this is kind of a bulkier style um, ball valve that's held together with four bolts so it can completely come apart and get cleaned. But um, I should maybe put that on my other mash tank because I use that one more often. Um, but this has got a hose barb and this is just for straight run out. I don't usually use this with a pump. Um, so this would just get a piece of tubing and it would come out and go into, um, if I elevate it above the brew kettle, I can just drain into the brew kettle, but usually I have it on a table like this and I just set it up and drain it into a bucket and then I pour the bucket into the brew kettle when I've collected all my wort, usually in two runnings. So um, that's that. Um, probably can't see it too well, but um, you know, this is a cooler, it has a lid. Um, it's just filled with air inside, but it's sealed, and so that air makes a pretty good insulator. And when, when you're mashing, that goes on top like that uh, to keep some of the heat in. So uh, heat rises, so it's important to have a lid here. Um, and I usually have a, star, a, a foam lid, depending on what the temperature is like outside, for my stainless steel cooler too. So uh, the stainless steel mash tun, sorry. Um, so all right, so now why don't we take a look inside here and I'll show you two different setups inside the cooler mash tun. Okay, here is the inside of my igloo cooler standard cylindrical uh, mash tun that I've converted. You can see the inside of the uh, bulkhead I put in there, which is just, again, you know, rubber washer, silicone washers sandwiched together to fit in the sidewall so there's no leaks. Um, you can see I've got a hose barb on the end of the coupler there. Let me show you how the false bottom goes in. Just reaches in here like this. It's kind of a tight fit, but it drops in like that. And in this case, this false bottom is made to fit in one of these coolers, so it pretty much fits the whole base, and it's a, a pretty snug fit. Works pretty good. And then when I when I mash, I just have to um, slide this little piece of tubing on there like that, and that's the connection. Um, this is the same false bottom from the Sankey keg, um, but I have a, there's a little elbow fitting in the dead center there, you can see it, and that has got another hose barb. That's how I make the connection with the vinyl tube. Um, so, I like using the false bottom, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but let me show you one other setup that's pretty common here, which is to use a stainless steel uh, plumbing hose braid. If I can get this tubing off of that dip tube there, off that hose barb, come on. Bear with me. So another common thing to do is to use something like this. I'm not going to unscrew it, but if I take the, the brass nipple off of the coupler, I could screw in that coupler, which is attached to stainless steel plumbing supply line, which looks something like this. See if I can do it and get some focus. Um, so it's just standard stainless appeal with the, the end has been crimped over. I don't know if you can see that. The end's been crimped over. And this is maybe just an eight or 10 inch piece of that. And it would look something like this. And it would just lie on the bottom. 
Um, I don't use it too often this way. I first tried the cooler this way. Um, I sort of like this, but because of its simplicity and how cheap it is, the only problem is with the hose braid is sometimes I don't know if it floats up off the bottom a little bit. When I'm stirring the mash, I, it gets moved around. Um, it's just not as stable as a nice solid false bottom in there. Efficiency is probably about the same either method, so it doesn't really matter too much, but um, that's what a, a stainless braid would look like inside this, the mash tun. So, um, so from here, why don't we just, I'll put the camera back in the regular position and I'll talk about pros and cons of the two mash tuns. Okay, there we go. So that's a quick tour of the inside and the outside of two different styles of mash tun, stainless steel keg, cylindrical cooler. Um, uh, I'll show you this too, I found this. So this is uh, just a piece of pink, like two inch uh, insulated foam, just it's hard foam. And I've wrapped it in duct tape just so it doesn't sh shred into a lot of those little pieces. And this is my makeshift lid for uh, this mash tun. And it's, ju it's just big enough that it sits on the lip of what's left from where I cut out the mash tun a long time ago, the, the lid of the keg rather. So that's just there. So let's talk about pros and cons. Um, I first started mashing in a square cooler with a stainless steel braid in it. And most of my all grain up to a point, I did a lot of all grain batches in just that standard cooler. And I liked that. Um, the beers came out fine, but I was always struggling to consistently hit my mash temperature when I wanted it to be a different mash temperature. If I always mashed at 154 all the time, it'd be pretty easy to just remember to heat my water to 160 something, 168 or so, knowing what my drop was. But the other thing is, if you're brewing in the summer, from brewing in the winter, from brewing a big beer versus a session beer, you know, it's it was hard to hit the numbers the way I wanted all the time. So I, I tried this setup, a stainless steel keg, direct fired with the pump to recirculate and a false bottom thinking, I could just mash in and get close, then I could always add heat or take the lid out and stir to lose heat to always hit my mash temp right where I wanted it within 10 minutes of incorporating the liquid in the grain right after doughing. And uh, for the most part, that works pretty good. Um, so the pro here is that you can always hit your mash temps um, and with the direct fired system you can step mash if you want. Uh, mashing out is super easy. Um, neither one of those two things I do too regularly. Um, the other thing that's really great about using a pump system and a direct fired mash ton is if you recirculating the wort the whole time, um, the wort becomes super clear. I mean the grain bed sets so well that the, the wort runs into the kettle very clear. I mean it's, it's not just lack of particulates, I mean it's crystal clear. Um, whereas over here on this side, even if you vorl off a few times, you'll get the particles out, but it's still cloudy. So it's pretty amazing how clear this, this comes out. Although I can't say that in either case, it leads to clearer beer in the end. Um, so that's a whole different debate. Um, so those are the pros. The cons of this is that <clears throat> when I brew outside, if there's a little bit of wind, the burner you know, you can't just set the burner to a, a trickle of a, of, a, of a heat and maintain temperature. It wants to rise no matter what. Um, you always apply, and you end up applying too much heat or not enough heat. So I, I find I've, I've got to pump the heat in. So meaning I turn the burner on, I'm recirculating, paying attention to the temperature, I turn the heat off. Um, and when it drops a little bit too low, so even though I can hit my temperatures at first, I do tend to have this up, down, up, down, up, down effect. And that's sort of starting to drive me crazy, um, just from a consistency standpoint, just trying to experiment with consistency and does that make better beer or does it at least make me happier as a brewer? Um, I do, I've started, so I've started wrapping this keg in uh, Reflectix material, I don't know where it is, but um, with a couple bungee cores to try to retain heat. But the problem with the size of this too is that I usually make a five gallon batch of beer, so the mash is really only about this high up. What I have noticed if I do double batches of beer, if I've got a big party coming up, and I do something like a 10 gallon mash, which is more up here, there's a lot more thermal mass and it tends to hold heat better. So I think, from my perspective, when you see people using these or recommending these, and that they don't lose that much heat, 
I think when people scale up to this big of a mash tun, they are doing bigger batches all the time, and that heat issue becomes a little bit less. But for me, I've always struggled to have this big empty head space in there, losing heat. Even if I put a couple towels on top of here with the lid, losing heat just up to the top, trying to keep that much mash warm and this much air space warm too. Um, I know air is supposed to be a good insulator, but the, the system is leaky, so it just loses heat um, with this stainless steel. It just seems to lose heat. So I like the control it gives me, but I have to babysit it. I mean, I really have to babysit it on the heat, off the heat, on the... So for 60 minutes of ash time, it's a lot of labor. So I recently got this about a year ago and started going back to the cooler. What I don't like about this is, like I said, control of the mash temp and getting it started. Although I am starting to just mash everything at 154. I don't really find it makes a big difference to mash in at 149 versus 158 or something. So I've just been striking a balance between 152 and 154. I'm trying to teach myself not to stress out so much over that number. Being a, a lab guy, where numbers are really important and what I do professionally, I tr I'm trying to relax and not have to hit a certain target mash temp. If I'm in a range, I'm okay with that. Um, but what I really do like, so the, the, the con here is that, you know, you might not have as much control as you do over here. Um, but one of the pros about this setup is that I really like setting up the mash, putting the lid on there, and walking away uh, to either clean a fermenter, sanitize some equipment, maybe keg some beer. If I've got a fermenter that's finished, I can keg beer while the mash is going on. I can do other things. Or uh, I just brew outside the door here. Uh, sometimes I've just set up a mash and uh, you know I can watch the football game or I can watch baseball or I, can, or I you know just start a movie or something. I just lounge out for an hour have a beer and let the mash go. Um, the other thing too is on this keg too I just want to get to the 60 minutes and be done with it. Over here if I go to 70 minutes, 90 minute mash I don't care it's holding heat and I, I don't really worry about it too much so it's a little bit less stressful. Um, this is better for numbers and control but it's a lot more work. Um, this is a probably a little bit more fun and I'm trying to make brewing more fun for myself and I think that's what doing a hobby is supposed to be all about. So um, I have been brewing more and more with this setup, and I'm trying to figure out how to best to incorporate this into a brew stand that's got three burners. Because uh, even when this sits close to the hot liquor tank, there's a lot of heat wash coming off of that tank when I'm trying to heat it. That the plastic, I'm just afraid of the plastic getting too much heat. So I need to build like some sort of riser, insulated riser, to get a little bit further away from the burner heat. The the sort of um, collateral damage heat from the other burners if I try to put this into the brew stand. Um, but the other thing too is that this is only 10 gallons. So John's talked about doing big beers and he's struggled to do some like imperial stouts uh, where he's going to do two mashes. Um, we're going to try an experiment where we do a reiterative mash at some point. Um, so 10 gallons you're kind of restricted depending on what kind of liquor to grist ratio you want. Over here, I've never had a problem. I can fill this thing all the way up to the top with grain and water and make basically as big a beer as I want over here in the 15 gallon system. So uh, I like the flexibility that this gives me for, for bigger batches. Um, like I said, a, I can do a double batch of beer, make 10 gallons of beer for a party. That's when I break this guy out and use this guy. So I still go back and forth which one I like the best. So, um, so I hope that helps a little bit and um, if there's any questions, put them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, like I said, we'll definitely do a couple of videos in the future where we highlight not just my brewing process, but John's brewing process. Just try to uh, break up the format a little bit so it's not just two dudes at a table. Um, we want to show you more equipment, show you a little more brewing, let you into our world and see how we brew too. So um, every good mash setup needs to have a good mash paddle. I hope you have a good mash paddle at home. This one's just a generic mash pedal made of uh, oak or something that I got at the store. Um, so from Mike, John's on the road. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video with Mash Tons. Give us a thumbs up, give us a like, visit us on our blog, brew-dues.com. Um, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. And for everybody who keeps following us, thank you so much. Cheers and brew on.